Kalispera in Athens to everybody. Um, Kalimera to our speakers in California. Uh, and welcome everybody to our virtual lecture series, um, which uh, has been interrupted for some time, but now we're coming back in, in full strength. As I sit here at my desk from the corner of my eye, I see the rock of the Acropolis and the Parthenon, it's faint lighting coming up as darkness is falling. And uh, that puts me very much in the mood for today's lecture. Uh, we will discuss how practical reason or the discovery of it uh, will trace and will trace it back to ancient Greece. And the full topic, the topic that was provided by the speaker is the Greek discovery of practical reason. Our guest uh, speaker is Professor uh, Josiah Ober, and facilitating the discussion is Professor Vula Tsuna. Our, our speaker uh, is Marcos and Eleni Kunalakis, Chair in honor of Constantine Mitsotakis and Professor of Political Science, Classics, and by courtesy, Philosophy at the at Stanford University. He is the founder, currently uh, faculty director of the Stanford Civics Initiative, an initiative that aims to provide um, superbly taught uh, courses uh, relevant to the ideas and practices of democratic citizenship. Ober's scholarship focuses on historical institutionalism and political theory especially democratic theory and the contemporary relevance of the political thought and practice of the ancient Greek world. He is the author of several books, uh, a most recent one, The Greeks and the Rational, The Discovery of Practical Reason, just published. We urge you to purchase it. It will make you wiser. Demopolis uh, is another book, Democracy Before Liberalism, that was published in 2017, and The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece in uh, 2015. Uh, he's written several other books, uh, mostly published by uh, Princeton University Press. He's also the author of many articles or co-author of many articles. Um, uh, Josh, Joshua Ober has written a lot. He holds his BA in history from the University of Minnesota and a PhD in history from the University of Michigan. He joined the Stanford faculty in 2006, having previously taught at my, uh, my own alma mater, Princeton, where he served as chairman of the Princeton Classics Department and of Stanford's later Political Science Department. Josh will be joined virtually by a good friend of CYA, Professor Vula Tsuna, uh, who also serves uh, on CYA's Board of Advisors. Vula uh, Tsuna is University of California, Santa Barbara Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Philosophy Department at uh, Santa Barbara. She is president and serves in a number of committees um, and a member of scientific committees. Uh, I was speaking with her a minute ago and she urged me not to mention them all because the list is indeed long enough. Um, uh, I will only say that she is co-editor of a series called Key Themes in Ancient Philosophy and has written books and published approximately 70 articles on Socrates, the minor Socratics, um, Plato, Aristotle, and the Hellenistic and Roman philosophers. Vula uh, earned her undergraduate degree uh, in philosophy from the University of Athens and completed her graduate studies at the University of Cambridge and later the University of Paris. She joined uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1997, became full professor there in 2006 and was recently awarded the title of distinguished professor at Santa Barbara. Thank you both for accepting our invitation today. We are honored. And um, 
uh, I will only say now to uh, our audience before I pass the floor to Ula that um, the, that uh, this uh, session is being recorded. And if anybody does not want to uh, uh, be recorded uh, and be archived, uh, should turn off their videos. Rula, the floor is yours. Alexi, thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thanks also to Billy Simopoulos. Uh, it is a, a, a true privilege and a great pleasure uh, to serve as a discussant for the paper of Josiah Uber, a greatly valued colleague whose work I have followed and I have very much admired since my, for a very long time. Um, before giving the floor to our speaker, uh, let me go over some administrative information. So through our discussion, uh, according to CYA house rules, um, you can submit your questions using the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, I shall be uh, happy to take questions, of course, in English, but also in Greek. I shall be very happy to translate if that is what you prefer. Um, as soon as uh, Josiah Uber concludes his presentations, um, first I shall give uh, uh, three minutes, no more, uh, summary of some salient points of the talk, and then immediately I shall open the floor for the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so uh, with uh, this is, I think, uh, all. Uh, and now I would like to yield the floor to Professor Josiah Uber for his presentation entitled The Greek Discovery of Practical Reason. Josiah. Sure. Thank you very much, Vula. Um, thank you, Alexis. Um, this is a great honor to be able to address the CYA family. Um, uh, and uh, to give you um, a brief introduction to uh, my uh, uh, new book. So I'm going to now share the screen um, uh, in order to give you a, um, uh, a chance to see what's going on uh, in this book. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we'll now proceed. So um, we can think about uh, uh, Greek uh, ethics and politics through um, these two great exemplars, um, uh, Socrates and Plato. And these two philosophers asked um, really a combined question, that is, how should I live? How should I live my life? And then a political question, how should we live um, our lives together? So uh, their question um, uh, was, how do we live? Their answer was, um, uh, we must discover the human good that is using moral reasoning, and then we should pursue that good using instrumental reasoning. And if we do this all and we do it right, we can achieve true happiness that is flourishing as ourselves, for individuals, and for um, our communities. So today, I'm only going to be talking about the middle term in this, um, the way in which um, it is possible to pursue the good using instrumental reasoning. So the challenge here is that pursuing the good requires background conditions um, of at least um, law and order. Um, and yet, communities, as the Greeks well knew, and we know to our um, uh, sadness uh, today, uh, modern communities um, uh, can in fact break down into um, factions, each seeking its own selfish ends, and these disputes may lead ultimately even to violent conflicts. Um, so the question then is, how can a whole large number of people act as a single collective agent, like a kind of quasi-individual, to create and sustain a constitutional order that might enable them to gain their desired ends. So uh, 
refer initially to um, uh, Socrates, not uh, at first uh, uh, through um, Plato, but uh, through his other student, uh, uh, Xenophon. And in um, answer to a question about how people make choices, um, Socrates, according to Xenophon, said, I think that all people choose out of what is available to them, what they think is most advantageous to themselves, and they do this. So Socrates has offered, I think, in this statement, a very succinct, almost algorithmic statement of what I call a folk theory of instrumental rationality. Now, his account is universal, that is all persons. It concerns choice, persons choose, based on the agent's beliefs, um, that is what they think, made under conditions of constraint, what's available to them, aimed at maximization of advantage, um, that is most advantageous to the agent, to themselves, and it results in action. They do this. So my argument is that Socrates' account of instrumental rationality in that passage is similar enough to modern rational choice theory, similar enough to allow us to use various tools and concepts from modern theories when analyzing classical texts and practices. And this really in turn um, allows us to read Greek texts as explorations of instrumental means to end rationality. And this can, I think, um, led, uh, shed some light on both political economy, that is how individual incentives align with political choices, and then ultimately on the question of democracy, that is collective self-government by many people. So uh, we get um, uh, in the ancient ethical tradition, two accounts of rationality. Um, the first is one of instrumental rationality. Um, instrumental rationality means to end reasoning um, uh, implies that the agent has orderly preferences, that is, they're ranked from top to bottom over outcomes and coherent beliefs about the state of the world. And using these orderly preferences and coherent beliefs, the agent chooses the option that maximizes that agent's utility, the things the agent wants, in light of the expected behavior of other agents and the agent then acts accordingly. So preferences, beliefs lead to action. And um, an exemplary uh, theorist of this kind of rationality um, are the ancient sophists, um, contemporary economists um, uh, and political scientists. For the other kind of rationality, which I'll be spending less time on, but which was extremely important, of course, to Plato and Aristotle, is ethical rationality. And here we see um, that the agent has the right or the ethical preferences over outcomes and true beliefs about the state of the world, and therefore chooses the right, that is the morally best option, and so the agent acts accordingly. Exemplary theorists um, of this ethical form of rationality, Socrates, Plato, and really uh, moral philosophers ever since. So Plato's claim in his great dialogue, The Republic, is that his ideal state um, called Callipolis, the beautiful, the beautiful city, is both instrumentally and ethically rational, but that Athens, the paradigmatic democratic city, is neither um, uh, instrumentally nor ethically rational. Now, my claim is going to be that democratic Athens is indeed instrumentally rational, although I'm not today going to be making an argument for the ethical rationality of um, the ancient state. So uh, let's think about uh, rational and irrational states or regimes in Plato's Republic. Now, Plato comes up with a fascinating guiding analogy in the second book of the Republic. He claims, or his Socrates claims, that individual psychology is modeled by the state and vice versa. 
so that the what he called the soul of the individual and the regime of the state are the same. So a democratic soul is um, a characteristic of the democratic state, for example. Um, his descriptive method um, in uh, Republic Book 8 um, is to um, give an account of the various regimes, um, starting with the very best one, Callipolis, the one he spent most of the dialogue describing, but then talks about a rank series of less good regimes, um, each worse than the last. Um, uh, and these are modeled by the ends that would be sought by a typical ruler. So because of this soul and regime analogy. So the best, of course, uh, ruler is the philosopher king who seeks wisdom. Um, the next is the timocrat, um, uh, the honor seeker. Um, the third is the oligarch who seeks wealth. The fourth is the democrat, who's concerned with freedom and equality. And the fifth then, um, the very worst, um, is the tyrant. So once again, this is a ranked list. And one question we can ask is, why is democracy ranked so low? Well, I think that for Plato, the argument is because the democracy was irrational, and irrational in this sort of formal sense. Um, uh, it was irrational, he says, because of the conjunction of freedom and equality um, in the way that the Democrat makes decisions. So democratic irrationality then arises from the commitment of the model Democrat, the ruler of the democracy, and therefore the regime to both freedom and equality, unlike honor for the Timocrat or wealth for the oligarch, freedom and equality are not taken by Plato's Democrat to be goods in themselves that might be maximized, um, and nor do they specify a desired outcome or end. So instead, freedom for Plato opens a doorway onto a wide range of goods and a comparably diverse range of actions then aimed at securing that wide diverse range of goods. And meanwhile, equality leads the Democrat to be indifferent in this kind of technical sense that choice theorists use, that is, it's just a coin flip between one thing and another, to be indifferent to the possession of one good over another. So each seems to the Democrat at a given moment um, to be of equal value. And so as a result then of this interaction between freedom and equality, each of the many goods available to the Democrat catches his attention just momentarily. And each is just pursued with great avidity and then drops in favor of some other freely available and for him equally desirable good. Goods, of course, are many and um, uh, all equally desirable. So abandoning the one, picking up another, means nothing. It's costless um, for Plato's Democrat in terms of his own sort of psychological inner accounting. And so to sums up, this is a famous quote from um, uh, Plato's Republic. The democratic citizen lives on, yielding day by day to the desire at hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute. At other times, he drinks only water and is on a diet. Sometimes he goes in for physical training, and at other times he's idle and neglects everything. And sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. He often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. If he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried in that direction, if money makers in that other one, and there's neither order nor necessity in his life. And he calls it pleasant, free, and blessedly happy, and he follows it for as long as he lives. Well, this account of democratic irrationality is picked up, or at least mirrored, by some really influential modern thinkers. For example, Joseph Schumpeter, in his great book, Democracy, Capitalism, and Socialism, claimed that a mass of citizens, ordinary citizens, um, are never capable of ruling themselves. It's just no coherent idea, because, said Schumpeter, a citizenry can have no collective will. Once again, that range of goods that citizens um, choose to pursue. 
And then William Riker, um, in another really influential Edgel book, um, claimed that um, democratic voting is incoherent because whenever a group of um, citizens is voting on three or more options, they are fatally liable to disorderly preferences um, uh, so that they will end up um, uh, uh, preferring uh, A over B and B over C and then C over A. Um, so it becomes simply a cycle um, and therefore um, uh, uh, it's all um, uh, incoherent um, and this kind of cycling can be manipulated by people who um, are clever leaders. More recently, uh, Brian Kaplan and Jason Brennan have made similar kind of arguments about why democracy just can't work. And yet, in modernity and in antiquity, Surprisingly, democracy does deliver certain goods. And indeed, Plato was certainly worried that democratic Athens performed all too well, at least in grossly material terms. So in the dialogue Gorgias, Socrates um, disparages Athens' leaders, the famous leaders of the fifth century, Themistocles and Pericles, who quote, they, that is ignorant people say, made Athens great. Those leaders, he said, failed to teach moderation or justice. Instead, they just filled the state with the sort of trash that people happen to desire. What is that trash? Um, well, um, city walls, naval yards, and revenues. That is exactly the instrumental means to the ends of security and welfare. A lot of Ath Athenians, I think at the time, thought yeah, that's pretty good. Um, uh, those are indeed the things we want. So we have this puzzle of democracy's capacity. Um, and in fact, as I've tried to show in another book, Athens really was a high performing city state, especially when it was democratic. Um, delivered high levels of welfare and security um, by comparison with other pre-modern states, manifested higher capacity when it had a democratic constitution than when ruled by tyrants or oligarchs and outperformed most other Greek city-states according to all available measures. So if democracy does deliver at least certain goods, material goods, um, believed to be valuable ends by Democrats, uh, if not in moral philosophy and not in Plato's moral terms, then how does democracy supply those means? Um, how does democracy avoid irrationality? I think that's an important question for us, just as it was um, for Plato. Well, uh, um, it certainly was a question for the Greeks, for ordinary Greeks. Um, uh, and uh, the ancient Greek answer is a constitutional bargain resulting in dynamic institutions and a shared commitment to democratic norms. And so we have to ask, how was that bargain struck? Well, it was struck um, through various um, constitutional um, uh, reforms, uh, a series of reforms um, uh, over uh, a period of uh, 180 years. I don't have time to give an institutional history of Athens today. You're probably relieved uh, to hear that. Um, but I think it's important for us to uh, recognize that that's the background. So the hypothesis then um, that I present is that democracy as the rule of the people provides the framework for the development of a rational state, rational in this means to end sense, um, capable of securing uh, security and welfare. How does it do this? Because the elites fail to capture the state so that it acts coherently enough so that elites can't step in saying, we need to run things or the world is going to fall apart. That is, ordinary citizens are collectively capable of making choices based on their preferences and their beliefs. And um, Athens, in its democratic constitution, adapts to change conditions with continuous experimentation, um, driving um, uh, innovation, um, institutional innovation. And all of this is made possible by the co-evolution of institutions and norms. So the formal rules and then the background informal rules um, that govern how we're supposed to be doing things around here according to um, uh, what people think about one another. So um, to test that rational state hypothesis, um, uh, we need to think about preferences, beliefs, 
choice and action. That's again the formal uh, definition of what instrumental rationality demands. So how about rational preferences? The old oligarch, um, this wonderful, weird, short essay written sometime in the late fifth century BCE and the, probably uh, right about the beginning of the Peloponnesian War. Um, the, uh, this anonymous uh, author, we just call him the old oligarch, um, uh, writes that democracy is morally reprehensible. It's the rule of the bad over the good. Um, uh, the many um, over the few. Um, and yet, he says, the point of this essay is to show his reader, assumed to be an oligarch like himself, how well Athens' many ordinary citizens do, in fact, manage affairs in their own self-interest. Um, ordinary Athenians, he said, have rank-ordered preferences, which prominently include not being enslaved, as they would be um, under an oligarchy, um, and living well from the distribution um, of uh, government offices by desert. Therefore, the elites actually um, uh, do a lot of the work and the uh, many um, uh, benefit. His point is then that Athenian masses do get what they prefer. Um, and why do they? The key factor is a persistent internal threat. That is the risk that the oligarchs, if they took over, if they were running things, would simply enslave the many. A uh, wonderful book um, on Greek oligarchy um, by uh, Matthew Simonton, published a few years ago. So if we move from preferences to belief um, uh, and choice and action, if the old oligarch is right, um, uh, then diverse mass preferences are unified um, so the many can act as a kind of quasi-human by recognition of ongoing risks of their lowest ranked outcome, that is enslavement to the few. And moreover, despite the lack of education, which is assumed by the old oligarch, various other failings, the many in fact did have beliefs about the world that were coherent enough to enable these unified preferences over certain outcomes, like not being enslaved, to leave to rational, that is the best available choices and cooperative collective action. So in some then, many diverse individuals did succeed in behaving over time as a rational collective choice, yet how? And this brings us back to the institutions and norms, um, uh, the norms of the assembly um, and the norms um, uh, and institutional rules um, uh, of the uh, law courts um, uh, and of the council. So uh, Socrates in Plato's dialogue Protagoras, in fact, does um, accept that the Athenians are able to formulate right beliefs, at least on some technical matters, based on expert testimony. So he says that when we Athenians are gathered in assembly and we're dealing with some affair of building, then we send for builders on advi uh, on, as advisors on what's proposed to be built, or if it's a case of warship construction, ship architects, and so on, on all matters which are considered to be learnable and teachable. And if the people do not believe them, uh, that someone uh, is an expert who attempts to advise them, no matter how handsome and wealthy and well-born he may be, not one of these things induces them to accept him as an advisor. They laugh and shout him down. That's how they proceed in matters in which they believe there is um, relevant expertise. So once again, is forming relevant, uh, uh, coherent beliefs based on expert testimony. Uh, so recent work um, uh, by Mirko Canavera um, uh, at University of Edinburgh has argued, I think, very persuasively that based on this background expert testimony in Athens and other Greek democratic cities, the procedure of the assembly was in fact designed to drive towards consensus. Um, uh, that uh, once a degree is proposed, the conveners of the assembly accept amendments from the floor. These amendments are judged on the basis of the audience response. 
And the idea is to get as close as possible um, to a unanimous decision. Um, now, this is liable to various um, uh, voting cascades and other problems, um, uh, but it's relatively immune to the kind of cycling and manipulation that William Riker was concerned with. And then we also have rationality of innovation and accountability. As Federica Carugati has argued in a recent book, um, the Athenian law court system was designed um, uh, to allow for both challenges of bad proposals, but um, to prevent the, um, those who want to stop good proposals by dragging it through the courts from doing so. Furthermore, as a body of recent work has shown, there are rational incentives of Athenian elites to cooperate uh, with the regime. Um, there are ways in which elites um, are given both honors um, for cooperating and uh, punished for not cooperating. And this is really quite systematic um, in Athens and other Greek uh, democracies. So the conclusion then, democratic rationality. Athens was an instrumentally rational state, uh, state in the sense of having a collective ruler, the people of Athens, the citizens of Athens, who did have ranked preferences, that is not being enslaved, coherent beliefs, including beliefs about risk and other agents' preferences like uh, elites, capacity to make choices and act on preferences and beliefs, to gain the best available outcome. They had institutions and norms which systematically pro uh, promoted cooperation across social groups by um, incentive compatibility. And the upshot then is that Athens, democratic Athens and other Greek democracies were um, high, um, high capacity um, uh, instrumentally rational states. Question that I leave you with today Two, the first one, can a modern democracy be instrumentally rational? Can we do as well as the ancient Greeks? Can citizens align their preferences to form coherent beliefs and act accordingly? Can we get beyond the kind of polarization um, and factionalism that seems to infect uh, modern democracy? And finally, can any democracy be ethically rational? Can, a de can democratic citizens choose the right options based on true beliefs? Is there any way that we could approach the ethical ideal um, that I have not addressed uh, in this uh, uh, paper, but which was so important um, to the Greek philosophical tradition? Well, that remains to be seen um, in the meantime. Uh, if you are uh, interested, um, uh, the book uh, is just out. Um, in fact, today is the official publication date. Um, so I once again <laughs> thank uh, uh, College Year in Athens um, for giving me this opportunity um, uh, to present my work to you. Well, uh... Josh, thank you very much for this fascinating talk and it's a big day today. So congratulations upon the appearance of the book. Uh, let me just uh, give a very quick summary, it basically coincides almost with the end of your talk and then immediately pass on to the discussion. So the paper offers a powerful and convincing defense against the criticism of democracy as a constitution fraught with irrationality. While the charge in question is encountered in contemporary critics of democracy, it has its roots in Plato. In Republic 8, Plato argues that because of the boundless freedom and equality prevalent in the democratic police, the latter cannot sustain an ordered set of preferences over desired outcomes. It operates on the basis of false beliefs about the state of the world, and it fails to act according to its own decisions. Josiah Ober's profound and detailed analysis in his book demonstrates that, in fact, Athenian democracy did not suffer from these shortcomings. According to his argument, even conceding that 4th century Athens does not, mean the, does not meet the platonic standard of ethical rationality entailing happiness, it does exhibit instrumental rationality in 
Its value and pursue consistently and above all other things, security, welfare, and the avoidance of tyranny. Both collectively and individually, they make choices on the basis of beliefs informed by experts and act in accordance with hierarchically ordered preferences. Second, Athenian democracy promotes or facilitates what Josiah Uber calls bargains, which I understand to be productive compromises between the interests of competing groups. And third, the norms, institutions, and mechanisms of Athenian democracy in the post-classical era both presuppose and express instrumental rationality. These claims are corroborated in the paper through an incisive analysis of the deliberative processes of the assembly, of the modus operandi of the Council of 500, of the system level rationality of the courts, and finally, of the requirements of competence and loyalty for officials responsible for the running of the state. In sum, Josiah Ober shows that the success of the Athenian state is neither accidental nor puzzling. It is the result of the development and ongoing improvement of the democratic constitution, whose rational procedures enabled the Athenian politeia to perform at a high level, adapt to changing conditions, and prevail for a long time. So, uh, I don't know, Jos, whether you would like to say a word to this, or should we pass on directly to Q&A? I am happy to move directly to Q&A. Thank you, Vula, for that very succinct, very clear, and very generous uh, account of, uh, of my paper. Very good. Thank you very much. I am opening the floor to the discussion, then. Uh, from uh, Steios Vrivivakis, the first question. Uh, thank you so much for this fascinating talk, uh, says Steios. Uh, regarding your final questions, could you say a little about your own construal of ethical rationality? Are you committed to some conception of value realism informing a more or less determinate ideal of the good life? Good. Thank you very much. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and I do try to address this um, in some detail um, uh, in the book. So the big difference between instrumental rationality and ethical rationality is that the um, ethical rationality assumes that there is um, an objective good or an objective end um, that a rational agent ought to be seeking. And so um, the ethically uh, rational agent is one who has rational desires, not just rational means, um, but actually desires what the agent ought to desire according to some objective standard. Um, and that, of course, is really is, uh, is challenging because then what is that? Um, uh, and is that um, in any way compatible with um, a commitment to um, uh, pluralism, um, uh, a, a world in which people might might have different ends that they seek. I think that um, one way to try to address this, perhaps without going all the way to the kind of full objective uh, um, objectivity of ends um, uh, that Plato and Aristotle were both um, in their own ways uh, committed to, um, is to say that at least um, a democratic society ought to have some ends um, that it can ag agree are um, not only instrument, you know, not only instrumentally valuable, not only um, uh, uh, materially valuable, um, but there has to be some conception of democracy as a good in itself, um, some good to what we do together as citizens, some good um, that we gain by being participants in a common enterprise um, of governing ourselves um, uh, without a master. I think if we give up on the idea that democracy is, in some sense, a good in itself, um, then it becomes very hard um, uh, for us to um, uh, have uh, really a, a democracy that works. So I tend to think that democracy actually needs at least a very 
thin version of the kind of rich form of ethical um, uh, rationality that was um, asked for, for by Plato and Aristotle. I think if we um, thin it down to the point in which we share nothing in common, in which we see no intrinsic value to what we're doing together as citizens, um, then we're in trouble. Um, so I think that is what really I would call for um, you know, the citizens of a democratic society, whether it be Greece or, or America, um, uh, to recommit to um, is to uh, find a way um, uh, that we can, as citizens, recognize the value of being citizens as opposed to subjects um, of a master. Thank you, Josiah. The next question is from uh, Nano Marinatos. Uh, let me just uh, see it here. Uh, Thank you, Josiah. This is from Nano Marinatos. Mm -hmm. Athenian democracy had one major failure. The crowds were driven by emotion, anger, or delusion. But you're right that the institutions were rational. So the yeah, I mean, this is this is really the problem. I mean, that indeed you cannot get emotion um, out of um, uh, human decision making, even as an individual. Um, uh, I think we all have cases in which um, uh, uh, after we've made some choice, we look back and say, I didn't. That was. I didn't do that rationally. I didn't. I didn't think about uh, you know my real deep rank ordered preferences. I just jumped at some thing, um, uh, or I went for some uh, uh, goal that actually wasn't really available to me in the first place. So um, yes, you can't get emotion you know, emotion out of it, and indeed um, emotion um, can overcome uh, the rational you know rational decision making in in an assembly. Um, but if um, Athens, uh, uh, if the Athenian uh, assembly was consistently and always um, uh, driven by emotion, if they were always just doing what Plato's Democrat accuses them of, or accuses the Democrat of doing, jumping from one thing and another without any coherence, it's impossible to um, explain how Athens, in fact, um, conducted um, uh, a rational policy, how they, in fact, secured um, uh, uh, welfare security um, uh, over uh, a long period of time. Now, clearly, we all know you know, cases in which they went completely wrong, in which the assembly was overcome by emotion, made very bad choices. But um, if they did that all the time, um, Athens uh, couldn't have uh, survived uh, for 180 years as a democratic state, as we know it did. Right. Thank you. The next question is from Chloe Bala. Thank you. I was wondering if you could make a comment on the methodological constraints, given that most of our written sources about Greek democracy come from its critics. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a really important point. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things that um, uh, has been so important about contemporary uh, work is that we've been able to reconstruct um, a lot of what's going on in the actual institutions and indeed the background norms um, of the democratic state um, by careful analysis um, of speeches given in Athenian law courts um, to large bodies of jurors, um, and therefore speeches that had to at least take into account um, the attitudes, um, the uh, beliefs um, of the jurors, and also the um, uh, ever-expanding body of uh, uh, documentary evidence that we have from inscriptions, not only from Athens, but from democratic states um, uh, in uh, other parts of mainland Greece um, and in uh, uh, Western Anatolia. So um, the, the uh, use of these non-elite or not directly elite, not elites to elite uh, uh, literature has been absolutely key in understanding how institutions work. But I think it's really um, uh, important to remember that we need to go back then to elite literature, to Plato, Aristotle, who are writing for their fellow philosophers or people that might become uh, their fellow philosophers, um, because they really had remarkably deep insight into the background um, psychological processes um, uh, that were, um, uh, they 
carefully observed um, uh, were operative um, in the world in which they lived. Um, so they give us really a clear account of instrumental rationality, even while giving a severe critique of any kind of life that's lived merely instrumentally or any kind of in, uh, regime um, that's organized merely instrumentally. So they had to understand instrumental rationality in order to explain the world that they lived in, even while criticizing the failings of an instrumentally rational um, choice-making method um, uh, that was uh, divorced from uh, this kind of ethical rationality. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, perhaps I may please ask a question, Josh? Certainly. Um, I mean, I was wondering what's, what exactly is the role of freedom in the Platonic critique? Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, you take it, I think you take it to be the case you take the critique to be freedom isn't treated as an unconditional good mm -hmm. and that is why and the door is open to all sorts of goods mm -hmm. hence no hierarchization um no preference no orderly preferences no true beliefs mm -hmm. no uh subsequent action mm -hmm. but i wonder i Another way, perhaps, that one could see it is that the, 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 the Democrats, democracy takes unrestrained freedom to be an unconditional good, in fact, the only unconditional good. And because of the nature of that good, the door is left open to all sorts of other goods to come in in a humdrum fashion and the inability to to put them into some sort of order and hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. Now this is a it's a, it's a great question, um, and uh, uh, this I think is one of the really difficult questions that we can we can pose of um, uh, Plato's uh, uh, ideas about about freedom. Uh, the way I go about it is to ask: In what sense um, is uh, the good um, that is sought? capable of being maximized. Um, because I think that, um, remember in that original quote, um, uh, Socrates says that people seek, um, everyone seeks what is most advantageous. Um, that's a, it's, a, you know, it's a maximization. Um, uh, and so uh, the um, uh, philosopher um, can seek to maximize wisdom, right? Presumably, max there's some there's a ceiling. Um, maximum wisdom, I assume, is the um, complete uh, um, understanding, knowledge um, uh, of the forms, especially the form of the good. And if you get that, you have the maximum. That's that's that that's everything. Um, but then uh, we take uh, then the next down, um, the honor lover um, uh, seeks honors, seeks victory. And that can be sort of ever, almost ever expanding. I mean, you can never have too many honors, right? Um, uh, uh, you can never have too many victories um, uh, in, in, in battle. There can always be another victory. There can always be another, you know, crown that you can get from your, uh, whatever you imagine these, these honors as being. So that really can be maximized. Um, and likewise, uh, in perhaps the most obvious sense, um, the oligarch um, can maximize wealth. So the oligarch really is a hoarder um, for Plato. Um, he doesn't just use his, doesn't get wealth just to use it gets wealth to get well, um, doesn't like spending his own wealth because then he has less of it. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of a pure form of maximization. He's just heaping up um, the wealth in his, in his storeroom and there's no end to it. Um, uh, oh. So he can maximize on the thing that is his end. Freedom doesn't seem to have that same feature. Oh. Uh, uh, freedom seems to be either you're free or you're not free. Either you're absolutely free or you're, you know, you can be sort of conditionally free, I suppose. You're free in this domain rather than that domain. So you, you might imagine it as something that was had to expand over being free in every sense. But it doesn't seem to have that same um, 
feature of being a thing that can be you know heaped up um, uh, uh, to some um, uh, so, to some some maximum um, so in that sense and then of course with the uh, famous passage that I quoted in which all the things that the that the Democrat does pursue um, seem to be um, allowed but you know in, in, you know made possible by freedom but that's not really what he wants he wants you know to play soldier or play philosopher or whatever it whatever it may be right. so you're right there is a sense in which it is the good of democracy is freedom mm -hmm. but it does have this different feature from the other mm -hmm. goods the it's other, a different the structure yeah. yeah yeah i agree thank you very much i see uh, another question uh, this is from uh, uh, gina lebkuhe Thanks for this fascinating and informative talk, Professor Ober. I found your argument about the instrumental rationality of Greek democracy convincing. And I thought your point that a shared thin ethical rationality may be important for democracies to succeed interesting. I'm wondering though, whether you think democracy has only instrumental value, that is democracy is value as a system of government grounded in whether it is instrumentally or ethically rational. And if so, it seems that this opens the door to Brennan's contemporary critique that other systems of government might be better means to these ends. Or if democracy is intrinsically valuable, why is it valuable and could this value serve as the shared value for a thin ethical rationality. I hope that question makes sense. Thanks again for the interesting talk. It makes lots of sense. Thank you. Um, uh, and um, to answer this fully, I need to talk at greater length than I will today, but uh, 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 let me uh, start. So here I'm going to say that the person I think, the, the, the thinker I think has the best answer for us on this is Aristotle. Um, uh, that Aristotle says famously that we are political animals. Um, uh, and he unpacks that in various ways. Um, we're animals who must live in a community and should live in a coherent community. Um, but we're also animals that have um, this unique form of sociability. Um, we can't flourish outside of um, uh, a community. Um, and we have these other two features um, that other animals don't have. Um, uh, one is the capacity to reason. Um, both, he's very clear about it, instrumental re reasoning, means to end reasoning, but also reason about um, uh, good and bad, right and wrong. Um, uh, and uh, finally, we have the capacity to communicate in a way that other animals don't. We have language. Um, uh, so uh, we use language then to communicate about these um, things that we, we care about, um, uh, you know, um, instrumental ends and uh, moral ends. Um, so put those things together. We're highly sociable, we are communicative, and we are reason using. Um, uh, Together, I think that creates a package of um, being a democratic citizen. Um, because what should we reason together about? What should we communicate about? Certainly the things that are most important to us um, uh, uh, as um, uh, members of a community, this highly sociable uh, uh, sort of animal. If we're restricted in that, um, if we're simply told um, what is the best, um, if we're simply uh, uh, denied the capacity to use our reason towards um, uh, the basically the, the ways to live our lives together, the judgments to make about how to uh, organize our lives together, then we've been denied something fundamental as the kind of being we are. Um, and so uh, I think in that sense, um, not living in a democracy is to fail to fully instantiate the kind of human that each of us is. Um, uh, and I think that gives an argument to the tyrant who says, I could deliver more of X, Y, and Z, but you said, but you can't deliver more of acting, freely expressing, freely um, uh, manifesting um, uh, my humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very helpful, thank you. This is an answer by Gina Libguha. Anybody else? Any other questions? 
Well, we are right on time, then it remains to thank our speaker, Josiah Ober. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. And thank you, thank everybody for your presence and your contributions. Thank you all for um, honoring me with your presence. Um, thank you, Vola, for this uh, fantastic uh, uh, comments and for running the session. Um, uh, and I hope we'll all have a chance to uh, uh, talk again sometime um, uh, in, the, in, in the near future. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody.